talking about seasonal affective disorder, winter depression. It's a little strange talking about it on near the longest day of the year, but it actually makes some sense because I know sometimes when we have these uh, public forums in the wintertime, uh, the people who are affected are too depressed to come out to hear a lecture. So maybe this is an appropriate time to be talking about uh, seasonal affective disorder and, and light treatment. So I'm just going to give a very quick overview on what seasonal affective disorder is, how common it is, and uh, this uh, really interesting treatment with bright light e exposure and uh, how you can get more information uh, about this condition and its treatment. So this slide really shows the uh, two aspects of seasonal affective disorder. And this is really a condition where uh, people get clinically depressed in the wintertime. And by clinically depressed, I don't just mean kind of the winter blahs, but they have a lot of physical and emotional symptoms that we associate uh, with a diagnosis of depression, a medical condition uh, that is associated with significant impairment in function. So these are not just folks who feel a little bit down and have a little bit of uh, effect on their, on their work and home life. They have major effects. And that's what we tell people, that if you're experiencing symptoms of depression and it is really affecting your life, you should be assessed. The um, first person to talk to would probably be your family doctor because many of the symptoms that we see in this condition are also could be caused by other medical conditions uh, that need to be ruled out. But the interesting thing about this particular um, condition that we also call winter depression is that people only get depressed in the wintertime and usually starts in the fall, um, uh, late fall, early winter, extends through the winter time, and then gets better in the spring. And by summertime, people are feeling perfectly well. And that's how we distinguish it from other types of depression where it extends for longer periods and doesn't seem to have this seasonal nature. And people have it a lot through their lives. So by definition, it happens uh, frequently. Uh, we have a clinic out at UBC, um, uh, UBC Hospital, uh, looking at seasonality for the past almost 20 years now. And on average, the patient who comes to see us for the first assessment has had 10 previous episodes of winter depression. And yet, for many of them, it's the first time they've sought help. And sometimes that's because they don't know that there's help available. Sometimes they don't recognize that what they have is a medical condition. And sometimes it's just the stigma of, of you know, seeing someone for, for what seems like a, a mental health condition. But I think the important thing is, is to recognize that there is very effective treatment out there and that uh, we encourage people to, to seek help. Now, besides this aspect of, of winter depression, there are also some certain symptoms that we associate uh, with this condition, and it's what I call the Garfield syndrome. Those of you who know uh, the cartoon Garfield know that, um, uh, that he suffers from, from many things, including things like overeating, okay, carbohydrate craving, uh, tends to eat more in the, um, uh, in the winter, and gain weight. And that's what happens to people with seasonal affective disorder. They have this overeating type of symptom compared to when they're feeling well. They also have significant problems with energy, feel very tired, and tend to oversleep when they're depressed. So they will spend lots of time in bed. They will sleep more hours than normal. It will be very hard for them to wake up. And about three-quarters of patients with uh, winter depression have these types of symptoms, which are a little different than other types of clinical depression that we see, where people tend to have trouble with insomnia and not eating enough. And so the, the symptoms of seasonal affective disorder are a little bit different uh, than, uh, than for other types of depression. So these, you know, look a lot like hibernation-type symptoms, right? People slow down, they eat more, they sleep more, and this significantly impairs their function. So they have trouble at work, they have trouble with their relationships, and, uh, and have problems uh, functioning. It, sometimes it gets to the point where they have more significant symptoms that we associate with depression, things like suicidal thoughts. Uh, and again, very important if you have suicidal thoughts to be seeing your doctor, uh, calling someone right away. So how common is this condition? 
Well, in places like Canada, in a northern uh, country like Canada where we have very long winters, it's actually very common. So that some of the studies done in Canada show that about 2% of the general population have a significant winter depression. And that really means that um, over a half a million Canadians, up to, up to a million Canadians, might suffer from this disorder. You'll notice that in the United States, the studies that have been done there show that it's a lower uh, prevalence. That means there's fewer people with the condition in the United States. And that's because we understand that um, as you go farther north, as you increase in latitude, the winter um, uh, days get shorter and shorter. And we think it's related to the uh, shorter winter days, the longer winter nights that occur. And that's why it's more common as you get farther north. Now this is again this clinical condition that we're talking about, uh, major depressive disorder with a seasonal pattern. But in fact, many people have milder versions, the so-called winter blahs. So there's probably 15 or 20 percent of the population in Canada that suffers some symptoms during the winter compared to the summer, but not to the point where they have a clinical depression. And the good news for them is that the same treatments that seem to help SAD may also help these milder winter blahs.